Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to God's Answers to Your Questions, the uh, Wednesday evening afternoon edition. I am your host, uh, CJ Marshall. Uh, if you're going in on Facebook, you can submit questions or comments to us on CJ Marshall, God's Answers. Or CEM Christian Navigation Ministries. We are not streaming on YouTube uh, today. That YouTube will be updated uh, later. Uh, but um, join, let me bring in a panelist. Joining me today is uh, Curtis Cooper. How you doing, Curtis? I'm doing great. Good to be with you, CJ. Uh, so, so, Curtis, would you mind praying for us, and then we'll get started? Yeah, let's let's go to God in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Our God in heaven, we humble ourselves before you. We are so thankful for today. We're so thankful for the beauty of your creation and just the wonderful weather we've been having. And, Lord, we're so thankful that we have this opportunity to be able to sit down and open your word. Lord, help us have open and honest hearts. Help us look at the Old Testament and understand what that means for us as New Testament Christians. And help us consider and just give a lot of attention and thought to what it means to be those who follow Christ and, and follow the doctrine of Christ. And Lord, we just pray that you be with all of us. And um, Lord, we also pray that you be with those overseas who are fighting battles and wars and uh, the citizens that are there and we pray that you will bring peace and give mercy upon uh, shine mercy upon them and lord we love you so much you sure sense me amen. amen so so chris i gotta uh, change some things on the slide so i can connect it to my phone but to get the ball rolling uh, what are some views that you've heard over the years regarding Christians and the Old Testament? What are some things that people often say? Should we study it? Should we not study it? Uh, what, what, what are some things you've heard? So you kind of get into, I'll say two extremes. You get into an extreme where people think that we ought to follow it. But the problem is, most of the time, those people are not even following the Old Testament. Um, they believe that. And then there's somewhere in the middle where they think that we can kind of pick and choose and select different things that we follow that's in the Old Testament, bring it over to the New Testament. I mean, you, things like instrumental music, things like uh, tithing, all those Kind of concepts people have kind of dragged into the New Testament and try to practice those along with the New Testament. Uh, but then you have you go to the other extreme of people who proclaim that we shouldn't study it; that's a waste of our time. That um, or there's just Christians who don't study it at all, and that really is a failure as well. We we need to have a proper balance and understanding of what those passages mean for us. Right. Uh, so have you ever heard... Uh, let me see if I can connect this. Okay. So, so have you ever heard a phrase that goes something like uh, this here? Let me share my slides again. Sorry about that. Have you ever heard this phrase, Curtis? Well, I'm just a New Testament Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in one sense, that's good and right, right? We, because we are Christians uh, and, and we... We, we are part of the New Covenant. I, I'm a New Covenant Christian. But what is the danger in saying that? 
the people, oh, but, well, not, not the danger in the phrase. The phrase is right, but what's the danger in the common thinking? Well, I'm not sure where you're trying to go with it, but I might say that if you say you're a New Testament Christian, but you don't really follow the New Testament, um, that's kind of a danger as far as the right. application of it. Like, you can say you're a New Testament Christian, but not really follow the New Testament, um, but instead practice your own things. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, not exactly what I was looking for. I was looking for more of what you started with when we use this phrase. Some people use this phrase to say, I'm a New Testament Christian. I don't study the Old oh. Testament. Uh, I mean, that doesn't apply to me. You, you know, that's just to the people at that time. And so, and yes, in one sense, we are under a new covenant. In another sense, uh, uh, that can be a danger. That could be a pitfall. Yeah, I think you're going to get into our study here in a little bit, um, just how important it really is. Um, I, I think that we need to spend, I mean, <clears throat> we spend a great deal of our time in the Old Testament to understand a lot of things um, that we need to, to kind of get our head wrapped around. Right. So, yeah. Uh, and so we, we want to talk about Christians and the Old Law. And the perfect place to start is, what was the old law? Uh, so, so if you had to answer this question uh, of what was the old law, what would you say? There's a lot of answers to that, but I'd probably say it's a covenant between God and the Israelites. Um, it was God delivering them and giving them his law to follow. Uh, it was, I mean, it was life for the Israelites. Right. And, and so, yeah, old law, Old Testament. Hey, if you have your Bibles, uh, about uh, midway through your Bible, you're going to come to the New Testament. And, and that, Testament is the uh, word for covenant. It, it just literally means a promise. Uh, and, and so the, the old law was a covenant given through Moses uh, for, for the people of Israel and for God. I want to go to Exodus 19. And notice this covenant, and I, I want us to notice who is this with and who, who uh, it wasn't with. Uh, Exodus 19, uh, 1 through 6, and Curtis, if you... Do do you want me to read that? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Exodus 19, 1 through 6 says, In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from uh, Ramph Ramphidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And so Israel camped there before the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell them, tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did to the Israelite or to the Egyptians, and how I, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will, shall be a special treasure to me above all the people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. 
So God was doing what there in Exodus 19? Well, God was, so it's interesting, before they even get the law, because this is kind of the beginning of everything going on here, God basically brings them before the mountain and says, don't forget who you are. You're my chosen vessel. You're, you're my nation. And I, I want to make a covenant with you. Right. Um, I'm going to make you my priests. And you're going to have special privileges in this covenant. Right. Uh, so God was making Israel part of his covenant people. Uh, if you notice here, uh, let's see, uh, uh, in Exodus 16, he even makes a distinction that this covenant was not with their fathers. Um, let's see, Exodus 16. And if you can spot that, or, or if you know where I'm going wrong with this, uh, you, you can give me the reference there. I'm looking forward. I'm trying to remember. I don't know what verse exactly. Uh, uh, I thought it was... Okay, Well, I guess I'll use the search term. <laughs> and Chelsea. You know what I'm looking for? I think I do. Um, I thought it was 16. Well, there's two people in the audience. Uh, here's a quick trivia question. <laughs> 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 um, hmm. let's see here. So, somewhere in Exodus 16, I thought, uh, 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 God tells them that, uh, this covenant is not with with your fathers, I did not make this covenant, but with you. Oh, let's see. Not with your fathers. Okay, me. Oh, uh, I was way off. Deuteronomy 5, uh, Deuteronomy 5. 1 uh, through 3? Yeah. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Go ahead and read that. This is Moses called all of Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and judgments which I speak in your hearing today, that you may learn that you may learn them and be careful to observe them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with us. And those who are here today, all of us who are alive, the Lord talked with, your, talked with you face to face on the mountain from the midst of the fire. I stood between the Lord and you uh, at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord, for you were afraid because of the fire and you did not go up to the mountain. And so this is a covenant that God made with Israel. Not with Abraham, not with Isaac, not with Jacob, not with their fathers. And so uh, I think I make this point later in the slide. Actually, none of them think about it. But, but uh, in John chapter 1 and verse 17, uh, John writes there that the law was given through Moses, contrasting the law through uh, with the thing that uh, Jesus gives. Uh, 
and now there's grace and truth. He um, says, you may read it. Well, I was there. Uh, oh, go ahead. John 1, 17, so the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And so this was a law, a, a covenant, a promise that was given through Moses. And so is there any comments on that? Just as you read and you study, you can see and you can you can kind of grasp the idea if you actually read the law and all the commandments that he gives. You can see that it was very specific to the Israelites. Right. Uh, just it, it, it was fitting for them in that time, in that place. Amen. Yeah, and, and he even gives us the reason over and over, the, the reason why God made this covenant is because of their time in Egypt. Uh, God brought you out of Egypt and therefore keep this covenant. And so uh, the covenant was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, yep, the covenant was given through Moses. Uh, that's funny. Uh, it was established between God and Israel, as we saw from Deuteronomy 5, 1 to 3. Uh, and uh, something better was coming. And, and Jeremiah 31 talks about that something better. Uh, but before we do that, is there any comments on what we were uh, talking about with God establishing a covenant with Israel? Okay. Uh, and so in Jeremiah 31, uh, 31 through 34, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for well, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, to the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sins no more. So we notice from verse 31 that God, through Jeremiah, prophesies a time where there's going to be a new covenant. And we notice from verse 32 that it's going to be a covenant that's different than the covenant God made with their fathers. And, and so uh, he clarifies who the fathers were, the, the fathers who broke the commandments. And, and this law is going to be put in their hearts and in their minds, and uh, they, they're all going to know the Lord through this law. And the final blessing, verse 34, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Be because remember, in the old law, in the old covenant, 
There was a yearly reminder of sins. Hebrews talks about that. And, and so this is something better. This is something that is looking forward to uh, this uh, new covenant. And so when people uh, read this in Jeremiah, they would have recognized something's coming. Uh, and they would have been eager for it. I think they would have recognized that this was going to be the time of the Messiah. Um, most prophecies were in regards to forgiveness and, and those type of things. So I, I think that's something that they would have drawn out from this. Oh, they're just going to, so when he comes, he's going to bring a new covenant. And... Right. And, and so, oh, uh, well, Oh, uh, what was the ultimate purpose of the law? I, I would say, and I know this is not what you have on there, but I would say the ultimate purpose of the, well, the ultimate purpose of the old law was to lead us to Christ. It was to be the... Um, basically school teacher to lead to teach us and lead us to Christ. Right. Uh what well, what were you gonna say? Uh well, nothing that doesn't make sense. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um yeah we we see in Galatians chapter three and verse uh 24, the, the purpose of the old law, all the rules, and, and all the, uh, all the specifications and all that pertaining to the old law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And so, uh, why don't, why don't you read that for us? Yeah, do you mind if I back up to um, read kind of the section? Let's read 21 to 35. It says, Is the law then against the promise of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would after or which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we no longer are under a tutor. And so, the the. Ultimate purpose of God's covenant with Israel was to bring about Jesus and the blessings that are associated with that. And it was, if you notice all throughout the prophets and all throughout the law, that uh, there is uh that there is this message of hope that something else is coming. And that something else is uh, Christ. And Paul says in verse uh, 24, uh, in order that we may be justified by faith, verse 22, so that the promise of by Faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The, the law was always about faith that would lead us to Christ. It, it was never meant to stand uh, forever, right? It was a shadow of good things to come. And there any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I want to read just a little bit more. If you back up to verse 19, right. I think it's helpful. He says, uh, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, 
to the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for only one, but God is the one. So the point is, why was the law given? Well, the law was to point us to our sins. To say, hey, look, you've got a sin problem, and uh, it's to point us to God who would tend to those things. And then he goes on to say that it's not against, like the law wasn't broken. It's not against the promises of God. Instead, it was to fulfill the promises of God. Like right. Christ is like the center point of all of the Bible. Like you, you go from Genesis to the end of the Old Testament, it's pointing towards Christ. Then you go from Revelation to Matthew, pointing back to Christ, right. the sacrifice and the resurrection. Um, so even today, the old law still serves that purpose. It shows us we, that we got a sin problem. We got a real issue. Uh, even the Old Testament shows that death comes, or that uh, death is the wages of our sin. Uh, even though, you know, that says it in the New Testament, but it shows that death is the wages of our sin. Right. Um, so that the law shows us just how bad sin is. I mean, shows us how brutal and how de devastating sin sin is. And then it's all just pointing forward to a time that we could be justified by our faith. Uh, but no, you notice verse 25, it says, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Like the old law, once Christ came, the old law served its main purpose. Like we're talking about main purpose, ultimate purpose. It served its ultimate purpose. And that was to bring us to Christ and point us to Christ. Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have any value. It still points us to our sin, still teaches us about God. We'll, we'll get into that. But, um, yeah. but once it was fulfilled, once the old law was fulfilled, um, it's, it's no longer in effect. We're not under it anymore. Right. And so that is a good segue. Uh, and what Jesus says that he came to do in regards to the old law, uh, he came to fulfill it in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 through 19. Uh, he, he says, Do you not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets? I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass in the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so, same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them uh, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of your scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and so... Uh, Jesus makes this distinction that he has not come to abolish and just destroy all that God set up. The, the law was good. It had a purpose. Jesus wasn't going to shatter that. But Jesus was going to bring it to the completion for Feel it. Uh, it. It's still. It, it's not intact, but I guess. Uh, I don't know, Curtis. Uh, maybe you can explain better what abolishing versus fulfilling is. Uh, so, if he had abolished it, um, it would have been like he was against it. 
like it was Christians versus Jews type things in regards to the 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 law. But no, he came to bring in a whole new uh, doctrine, and um, the the law, like. Well, it was, I'm trying to think of it in better terms. Um, the whole purpose of the law was Christ. Like the purpose of the, like we just talked about, the whole purpose of the law was to bring us to Him. Like, um, obviously, we just talked about once it fulfills its, its, its once it's fulfilled, once Christ came. There was no longer a need for the old law. Um, but to destroy it would have been like he's almost going against it. Right. But he really just came to fulfill it. Right. And, and before this, uh, he, well, uh, after this, uh, he talks about the misunderstandings of the old law. You've heard it said, but here's what this means. Uh, and, and so I think that's part of the fulfilling, bringing it into what it w was supposed to be, and, and then making a new system. And, and so he brought it to, it did its job. Uh, a tutor's job is to help the student uh, complete the math test, right? And, and ace the test. Well, what happens to that tutor once the, the need is met? That, that tutor moves on to another kid. That tutor leaves, right? The, the, now, now, was the tutor bad? Is that why he left? No. The, the purpose of the old law was met with, uh, and, and fulfilled in Christ. Well, the idea of a tutor there, um, it's the idea of like you would have somebody who would take care and tend up to a child. It was kind of like, um, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of the right term. Uh, you know, maybe somebody has a nanny today. Like their job would be to tend to the children, to teach the children, to um, take care of their needs. So it's kind of this picture of a child growing up and maturing. And once they get to an age where they've matured and they, they're independent, there's no longer a need for the nanny. If you were 25 years old and your parents still had a nanny, that'd be a little weird, wouldn't it? Like that's, that's kind of the picture is that there's a point in which the temporary uh, position is, is, is done away with. And now there's, uh, now there's um, maturity and there's no longer a need for, for that kind of guidance. And so, uh, Chris put 505, and I'm not even close to my uh, material stopping point. Do we want to stop here or go to 45 minutes? Um, let's give it five more minutes. I think that'll be fine. That'd be a good middle point, middle ground. We'll get to what we're talking about. Yeah, uh, I might skip. Skip some of us. Oh, yeah. Uh, I just explain it as we go along, and they can look up the verses themselves if they're right. Uh, and so, one of the other purposes of the law was to teach us of sin. And, and I'm gonna actually uh, look at this passage because this is important. Uh, Romans 3, uh, 19 to 20. I have a band-aid on my pinky because I fell right before the program and it's hard to... 
hard to flip pages without a pinky. Romans 3, 19 and 20. Uh, um, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth should be stopped and the whole world might be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being it will be justified in his sight, since to the law comes the knowledge of sin. Curtis, how, how would you describe what, what incest is? Well, I would only be able to describe it if somebody told me what it was to begin with. I would have to um be be taught that right uh when, when when paul says flee sexual immorality how do how do we know what sexual immorality only by only by what i'm told uh what i learn right and and so uh so, so that's what the law does it it teaches us the reality of the sin, and it gets us to see past the the superficialness of sin. Uh, is there any comments on that? Oh, very good. Okay, and so do we follow the old law? We do not. No. Uh, because it is obsolete, Hebrews 8, 17 talks about, uh, 7 to 13 talks about how the law was getting ready to pass away and something new was coming. It is a curse, Galatians 3, 10 talks about how we are. Cursed is that anyone who, uh, de- oh, cursed is anyone who does the, I can't quote that. I'll read it. It says, for as many as were works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not, con- or who does not continue the things which are written in the book of the law uh, to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Now, part of the point that he's making is that, uh, and he'll make it later on in chapter 5, is that if you try to live by the law, you are bound to live by the whole law, not part of the law. Right. And that's what they were doing in Galatians. They were picking certain things and saying, oh, well, you got to have these things in your life to be saved by Christ or to be saved by the gospel. And he talks about, uh, in the whole book, really the whole book, he talks about not substituting Christ for the law. Uh, Can't substitute grace or you lose grace. Um, We're not bound by things in the old law anymore. Right. So it's obsolete, it's a curse, uh, it's imperfect. Uh, if you go over to Hebrews 7, 18 and 19, uh, the Hebrew writer makes the point that if the law were perfect, there wouldn't be a need for Jesus. And so uh, I ran through those quickly, but is there anything you want to highlight? Light in any of those texts. Yeah, let, uh, I'm going to read one more passage in Galatians 4. I think it makes a strong point. In Galatians right. 4, um, verse 4, he says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. Now, 
the, his point that he's making is when Christ was on this earth, he lived under the law. He was under the Old Testament. Um, and that's why he followed the Old Testament. But the whole reason he was born under the law is to free us from the law so that we could have the adoption of sons, so that we could have the new covenant. We could become uh, Christians. Right. And so one more question we'll conclude is, well, we've looked at all of these different uh, points of the old laws and few why do we study the Old Testament? Well, uh, we, we study the Old Testament. Through it, uh, we understand Jesus. In John chapter 5, uh, Jesus says, The scriptures bear witness about me. Uh, let's see here. John chapter 5, verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. And he goes on. And so it's through our study in the old law in the Old Testament with all the imagery, with all the types, with all the shadows, is when we can open up the new and appreciate Jesus. And so think about this. If you were watching a movie and you walk in on the halfway point, what what do you what do you think you're gonna be thinking about? How it's gonna end. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, 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 I would be thinking, boy, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, I. Uh, I don't know the context. What, why is this happening, right? And why is that happening? And why is this a problem? Well, oh, you... Go ahead. I see what you're saying. I misunderstood what you were trying to say. Yeah, you would be confused. You would be... So, so if someone picks up the Bible and goes to the Gospels, without any reference point to the Lord, to the old law, could they understand something about Jesus? You might think he's a, he's a good person, he's a good moral teacher, he's... Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah they, they could understand something about Jesus, but... Is there something that Jesus said that wouldn't make sense without that beginning of the movie, if you will, beginning of the scene? Yes. You, you would understand why Jesus is here, why, why he says, 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 says certain things, you know, uh, and so through it, we understand Jesus. And there's also uh, the fact that Paul says that it was uh, written for our learning. Do you have Romans 5.14 up? Uh, I can. I'm at Romans 5.14. Yeah. Give me a second. Uh... Romans 15. Yeah, I didn't take that sounder, right? Romans 15, 4. What? 15. Says, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written more boldly to you on some points. I don't know. That's not right either. Well, oh, I, I know. Okay, sorry. Uh, for whatever things were written beforehand were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So, through the Old Law, through the Old Testament, we find 
uh, hope and through it, uh, as we talked about before, uh, we learn about sin. So that is all the time that we have. Uh, Chris, do you have any uh, final thoughts on that? Well, thank you. Like, the things that we learn from the Old Testament is, like, we learn about... We learn about God's wrath. We learn about God's love. We learn about God's patience. We kind of get like a full understanding of God's character from the old law. And if you if you can't, if you don't know who he is, then you're going to mistake who Christ is. And you're not going to understand why he came. There's so much that is so applicable that, um, that I think we really need to take a lot of time and dig into the old old testament right well thank you all for joining i hope that was helpful that was helpful for me to prepare for and go with you uh, through curtis and that's about all the time we have if here's our contact info you can Submit questions and comments during the week on Facebook, uh, through God's Answers, or YouTube on CJ Marshall. But until next week, thank you all.